Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius matters? Gifted brains are different. Podcast. An exploration of giftedness. This idea of gifted and what it is and what it isn't. Twice exceptionality. No two twice exceptional people are exactly the same. And neurodiversity. It's okay to be who you are. In childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is Mind Matters. Welcome to episode 55. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and today we're joined by Dr. Thomas Hebert, who's a professor of gifted and talented education in the College of Education at the University of South Carolina. Tom brings with him over 20 years in higher education, training graduate students and educators in gifted ed. It's not often that we can say with certainty that we're living through something monumental and historic. As we told our kids, bookmark this period of your lives and remember it. Our encounter with COVID-19 will be a life-changing event, and it's really hard to know what the world will look like on the other side. What we know is it'll be different, and we'll be changed. But first, we have to get to the other side. So we're working on a bonus episode that we'll release in the next few days where we'll talk about navigating these uncharted waters. We'll talk about ways families can use the time to build relationships or at least help existing relationships survive intact because it's unnatural for the human species to be sequestered and isolated. It takes a toll on the strongest relationships and combined with the uncertainty we're all feeling right now, it can weaken even very strong foundations. I'll bring on a special guest who is an author of several award-winning young adult novels and has been a family therapist for longer than I've been alive. So if you haven't yet, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and turn on your notifications because you won't want to miss it. Coming up next. I'm Tom Hebert, and I'm currently a professor of gifted and talented education at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. We're talking about boys and what they're made of, and how to make the recipe better. Stay where you are. Previously on Mind Matters. Hello, my name is Harry Thompson, and I am the author of The PDA Paradox. What is pathological demand avoidance? They will exhibit differences in communication, social interaction, and also uh, restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. PDA is best understood according to the literature as an anxiety driven need to remain in control and I tell people try not to get too hung up on the demand avoidance aspect because then it will make understanding how the child's presentation can differ in school more difficult uh, to grasp that's episode 54 look for it wherever you get your podcasts this is the mind matters podcast Last season, we featured an episode with Katherine Fishman Weaver about helping girls forge social bonds and self advocate. Today, it's the boys' turn. We're talking with Tom A. Bear about how we can help overcome social and personal obstacles inherent to boys, and specifically gifted boys. Tom, thanks for being here. Thank you. So, this is an area you've been studying for some time now. So, tell me what caused you to be interested in this topic and what motivated you to share what you've learned? Well, as a graduate of the University of Connecticut, where I pursued my master's as well as doctoral degree, I had the good fortune of working very closely with Joe Renzulli and Sally Reese. And Sally's research agenda from the early years was on gifted females. And I would often attend Sally's workshops or seminars and sit at the back of the room and cheer her on because I was certainly supportive of of her message. But as I sat there from session to session, I couldn't help but think, yeah, but we guys have challenges too. And that pretty much triggered the beginning of my research agenda as a young scholar. And I had the good fortune of entering the field at a time when Roper Review announced that it was to publish a special issue on the needs of gifted males, and they were looking for 
authors. It was the ideal opportunity for me to begin writing about something that I was becoming very passionate about. And um, my very first publication in the field as a doctoral student focused on the use of children's literature uh, to address the needs of bright boys in discussion groups, meaning bibliotherapy for bright boys. And um, it was there that I began to really pull together a number of issues or challenges that I thought gifted males were, were facing. What are some of the things that you've really found that are some of the social and emotional needs of gifted boys that maybe are people aren't aware of or they don't think about or maybe differ from, from bright girls? I think one issue that is parallel to an issue that young women face but may look different in young men is the whole notion of image management. Right. How a young man projects himself to the world, to the peer group, to the schools, and how he manages to negotiate day-to-day life um, being bright, being talented, and being male. And I think my best example of this would be an experience I had with a young man that I taught in the Department of Defense Dependent Schools. I was a a Dodds teacher in West Germany, working with the children whose moms and dads were in the army. And phenomenal experience. I was teacher of the gifted, K through 12. And it was in seventh and eighth grade gifted seminar that I met up with Eddie. Eddie was, according to the young women, the awesomest boy in seventh grade. (laughs) He was definitely charismatic. He was handsome. He was charming. He was a leader. And essentially, whatever Eddie determined, the rest of the peer group pretty much followed along. Well, Eddie the awesomest and his uh, and the other seventh graders decided one particular year that we needed to take a field trip. And I had taken this group the year before to London, and we had had a very wonderful experience. But these seventh graders decided they wanted to see a communist country. Mm. And we took a look at the map and decided that Budapest, Hungary would be the place to go. And they were, needless to say, very pumped up about the possibility of taking on this field trip. We would travel through Vienna, Austria and have an absolutely phenomenal experience. Well, American military families do not make big bucks, let's face it. So we spent a good portion of the academic year raising the thousands of dollars that it would take to uh, provide this opportunity for these kids. And Eddie was involved in the car washes and the candy sales and the spaghetti suppers and all of that good stuff, just like all of the other kids. But about two weeks before we were to leave for Budapest, I started hearing grumblings amongst the seventh grade boys. They were suddenly labeling this a dumb trip and that they didn't feel like going. When I probed, I discovered that Eddie had decided it was a dumb trip. And needless to say, I had a heart-to-heart, man-to-man talk with Eddie, the awesomest. (laughs) And I discovered something about Eddie that the rest of Bad Kreuznach High School did not know. And that was that he suffered seriously from motion sickness. And the whole notion of a 16-hour bus trip was something that he figured he could not contend with. You know, he explained, Mr. Abair, you just don't want to toss your cookies in front of your friends. <laughs> and so he, he had decided that he would not participate in the field trip. And as much as I talked with Eddie's parents and Eddie about different over-the-counter medications that he might use to deal with that challenge, he, his parents nor I could convince him 
to take advantage of the opportunity. So he did stay home. And because that, that image of being on top of the world, on, you know, being invulnerable, being the coolest dude in seventh grade was far more important to him than his involvement in that trip. And I, I can't help but think there are many other young men out there who probably do, are doing the same, camouflaging something about themselves in order to maintain that, that macho, on top of the world image. What are some things that you found, whether with Eddie or some of your other students, like what are the things that help? What do they need from us? Oh boy. Um, there are other challenges that I, I think we need to be aware of as well. And I learned from Eddie parental expectations can be pretty high. Um, Eddie was coming from a high ranking military officer. And um, the messages that gifted males receive, whether it be from parents or from society, or even messages from themselves can be very difficult. Um, I, I think of one young man that I worked with years ago. He came from a family where mom had spent each and every waking moment of her life <laughs> from the time he arrived in the world to nurturing this little guy. She did everything good mothers could possibly do. She read to him at an early age. I mean, she, she talked incessantly with that little guy. Um, in fact, her neighbors and friends would say they hated to visit the household because she never shut up. She was constantly talking to this little, this little boy. Not only did she talk to him, but she talked an awful lot about him, about how intelligent he was, how creative he was in front of proud grandparents and family and friends. And I can't help but think that that little boy picked up on mom's message and interpreted that as, ooh, if I'm going to maintain mom's love, I've got to continue to be as wonderful as she's described. And over time, this little guy became very, very tough on himself, took on perfectionistic tendencies that were out of control. In fact, his, his younger sister described a time when he came home from a day at high, in high school and threw a textbook across the dining room he, because he was so furious with himself for having earned a B minus on a French quiz. And there was a, an economic recession that was going on at the time that he was applying for colleges. And his number one choice, his number one school was Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont. When the admissions letter arrived from Middlebury, it, it was probably mom's happiest day. And, I, and as neighbors described, it was maybe 20 minutes from the time that letter was delivered to the time that mom plastered the Middlebury College bumper sticker on the back of the Volvo. Hmm. <laughs> Even though she was well-meaning and, and, and very loving and wanted to do all there was to nurture, I can't help but think that he picked up on those messages. And uh, on the night before he was to leave, he said to his grandfather, Gramps, I'm really nervous. I'm really scared. And his grandfather said, well, most college freshmen are anxious about going off to college. He said, what you're feeling is, is perfectly normal. And he said, no, Gramps, you, you don't understand. He said, I know how much it's going to cost for mom and dad to send me to this very expensive liberal arts college. He said, I know what the price tag is, and I know what's happening with dad's engineering firm right now. Times are really tough during this recession, and I know that's going to be difficult. I have just got to bring home a 4-0. And his grandfather just cringed when he heard his grandson say that, you know, just realizing that this trait or characteristic or this behavior that 
they had seen in this young boy early on was something that he continued to carry with him. And it took a lot of work on the part of that family to get him to understand that we love you for who you are, not for what you do. And so I think, I think gifted males sometimes lay a very heavy burden upon their own shoulders. Yeah. You know, I just read an article recently, Scott Barry Kaufman wrote, and he was talking about career choices of men and about how, you know, it's like, we really are emphasizing a lot, you know, oh, we need to get females into STEM and we need to get girls into all of these other, you know, these these careers, these tech careers and all these different things. But we really don't emphasize getting men into, I guess, what would be considered like more caring careers like education and, and, and nursing. And for whatever reason, you know, that's kind of a, seems like a societal pressure. Absolutely. And it goes unnoticed a lot. This is definitely something that we see in high creative boys. And that is what is referred to as psychological androgyny. Mm. The fact that they might be perfectly capable and comfortable expressing their creativity and their talents and their intelligence in ways that might be viewed as traditionally female. Mm -hmm. That's certainly an area where educators and counselors can support gifted males and celebrating the fact that they're capable of doing that and supporting them with that. So we've kind of talked about, you know, that image and also just that perfectionism, that expectation. Right. Are there other things that you notice that are really needs that go unnoticed about gifted boys? Um, a lot of gifted guys out there have a struggle with finding authentic friendships that are meaningful. There's a real need for somebody that they can truly share their authentic selves with, as opposed to just a good buddy or a bro on the sports team, someone that you can totally be yourself with and, and share, the, share the vulnerable side of you as, as well. A lot of adult men out there will readily admit that they truly never had a really good friend in another male. And um, there's been a lot of research done on that, on that topic. And male friendships are quite different from female friendships. There's no doubt about that. But we as men struggle with that. And mm-hmm. I have often shared this whole issue with um, workshops, in, in seminars. And typically, the audience is primarily female. And I will have women who will say, oh, Tom, let me tell you about my husband and about his very best friend. And I have noticed over the years that there's been a theme that runs through those conversations. I typically will ask, so tell me, what does your husband do professionally? And I get, my husband is a police officer. My husband is a firefighter. My husband is in the military. I have found the men who have a true soulmate in another male are men who have oftentimes dealt with serious adversity together. Mm. They, in their professional roles, are obviously required to support each other. I've heard men say, you know, the, the guy that I'm still the closest to is my friend John, who, you know, I survived Vietnam with, that type of thing. So mm-hmm. I've just found that fascinating. Uh, this, this, of course, is very anecdotal. I don't have hard data uh, on this, but I, I think it's certainly something we need to be aware of. It sounds to me like perhaps a stereotype, but men are not necessarily as comfortable being vulnerable with other men. Absolutely. But when you talk about those particular career choices, especially if there's been a trauma that's been associated with that, you're almost forced into it. Right. And then once you have that vulnerability, that real honesty, like that's where that relationship builds from. Absolutely. I've also seen in particular, more so today than ever before, but the whole notion of young men, I'm, I'm looking out at undergraduate populations on my campus. They really have a difficult time 
maintaining serious conversations with each other mm -hmm. to get young guys to talk to each other about something that is important can be a challenge for a, a classroom teacher or a, a school counselor. It's a different method of communication that we're seeing in this day and age. Um, I had an opportunity to teach an all male seminar to incoming freshmen. This was a, a few years ago, and I had 15, 15 young men who arrived for class every day, and I would walk into that classroom, and they'd all be seated there in perfect silence, waiting for the class to begin. There was no conversation going on whatsoever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had to learn strategies during the course of that semester to get them to talk in dyads in order to then contribute what took place in the conversation between two men to share with the entire group of 15. The whole notion of speaking up in class and sharing your, your thoughts about the issues that we were talking about was a challenge. And the, the seminar, the, this was an all-male seminar designed for gifted young men. It was entitled athlete, academic, or artist, you know, talent development for bright young men. And um, they had enrolled in the course because obviously they felt it was critical and, and it was something that they would benefit from. And yet it was a challenge for me to learn how to get them to open up and, and discuss about the very heavy duty issues that were prominent in their lives. Um, so I, I've learned definitely through that experience as well as through working with awesomest Eddie and, and others like him that the more often we're engaged in conversations with young men, we had better have some hands-on activity going on in order to get them to open up. That direct eye-to-eye -eye contact can be a little too intimidating or threatening to them, but you, um, you get them involved in something hands-on. Um, they're far more open with self-disclosure. And I'm reinforced in this every time I talk to parents who will say, I have my best conversation with my son in the car. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes. <laughs> As he looks out the windshield, he doesn't have to you know, give me the eye to eye. Or dad will say, you know, I, I put him to work polishing the car with me and I learn about that girl in algebra class that's driving him crazy. He said, you know, that's where I really find out about what's going on in his life. So I say to classroom teachers, get them engaged in something hands-on and the conversation is going to be far more meaningful. Yeah. And, and school counselors who work one-on-one -on -one with a male client will, will tell you, you know, that chess game that you have set up in your office is a great, <laughs> is a great way to get the counseling session started. They let down their guard a little bit more. Absolutely. Let me ask you about this. Are there some considerations that we need to make when we're talking about gifted boys who are from culturally diverse backgrounds? Absolutely. I mean, when you think about the whole notion of just navigating the dominant culture while being true to your own culture is really critical. That young man who finds himself, you know, the, the only African-American male in an AP math class, for example, finds, finds himself surrounded by the dominant culture, and yet he knows what he's going to be dealing with when he returns to the, to the cafeteria and has to contend with his African-American peer group. The, the kind of pressure or the expectations of the peer group for these guys and, um, and the whole notion of academic achievement is, is, a real, is definitely a real challenge, something that um, young men from the dominant culture do not have to negotiate. Yeah. We can't overlook the fact that these young men, regardless of which cultural group they're coming from, have to deal with microaggressions and racial discrimination in a variety of contexts. And 
What is happening across this country right now with young men of color is very disturbing. So we've got, we've got an awful lot of work to do in terms of supporting our gifted, young, culturally diverse males in dealing with those injustices. And with gifted males in general, we should encourage and help them to find activities beyond school or their homes or family circles. I definitely am a strong proponent of helping them find extracurricular activities and outlets for their talents that are clearly aligned with who they are and to experiment with as many different extracurricular activities, clubs, athletic groups as they can or as they may be interested in. I think it's in those different areas where they do find others like themselves. They find they do make friendship connections that can be incredibly important to them. And they also find through extracurricular involvement and athletics, they find mentors. Oftentimes the adults who are in charge of those opportunities or experiences are definitely the kind of people that we would want to guide and to support gifted boys. So that significant coach or that significant club advisor or that one particular teacher who is leading a group involved in a social action project, those people can be phenomenal in terms of making a a huge difference. So I think the mentoring and the friendship connection that might evolve from those experiences are, are beneficial. So I encourage parents to think seriously about helping their sons find outlets for their talents beyond the typical school day. And I, I would say the same is true of young men at the university. And I think the, the, the sooner we begin to do that, the better. I think elementary and middle school boys benefit with experimenting with different talents through different venues and, and making those critical connections. Thomas A. Bear, professor of gifted and talented education at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. Thank you for spending some time. I thank you, Emily. I've, I've enjoyed our conversation. No matter their gender, gifted kids are under pressure to conform. Gifted boys can be at risk of masking their interests and abilities in the same way that many gifted girls are. Gifted boys need validation from the adults in their lives, an environment that provides opportunities to pursue their talents, and role models who show them how to be true to themselves. We can give them permission to honor their emotions in a world that expects men to be stoic and strong in all situations. Let's work to remove the barriers that stand in the way of their success. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on Mind Matters. Walk with me, lead the way I will follow. You woke me up, I no longer feel hollow. We can help each other through this ever changing world.
Thanks again to Thomas Hebert. If you'd like to know more about him, you can go to our episode page and check out some links. It's at mindmatterspodcast.com. While you're there, you can also download the transcript of this episode, thanks to our Patreon supporters who make that possible. You can join them, by the way. Go to patreon.com slash mindmatters. We'd love to have you. We'd also like to have you follow us on Twitter. Follow us at MindMattersPod, and you can direct messages with guest ideas and other thoughts about the podcast. For Emily, I'm Dave Morris, the executive producer of Mind Matters. Thanks so much for listening, and tell a friend. Walk with me, lead the way I will Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.